like we are apparently maybe going into online only mode. We'll wait for more details. Um, but so far, it's a tweet from a politician, so we'll, I'm going to wait for some more official work. But it looks like that's probably going to happen, I would assume. Um, according to the, the tweet, I can't believe this is the world we live in these But according to the tweet <laughs> from our governor, uh, we might be having online only for the rest of the semester. So I'll make announcements. I'll, I'll work over spring break to figure out uh, if that is the case, what we're going to do with labs. Lecture, just business as usual. Uh, they're streamed to Twitch. We'll just keep doing the same thing. I might adjust the hours a little bit. Uh, if we're going online only, I'm, uh, I'm hoping I don't have to stream three times a day, or maybe I'll do three different things during those three hours. Uh, like our schedules can shift around a little bit. Uh, and, and we'll work with that. If I, whatever I end up doing doesn't work for everybody, let me know. I'll do something else. Uh, I'll do Twitch office hours. Some of the TAs have already been doing that. More of the TAs will be doing Twitch office hours. We'll, of course, utilize Piazza uh, like we had. Uh, most, so most of the course is business as usual. We're pretty well set up online already in 116. It's just the labs. I've got to figure out some way to do the labs. That's going to be the, the sticking point. Uh, but once I figure out something, we'll, we'll manage. We'll get through. Uh, any questions or any concerns about that? Or anybody have more official news than I get? That's seriously how we got the news, just so you know. Like, you're not... Uh, the fact that you didn't get an official email either, like, I didn't get anything. I got a tweet. So, there, there's no official word yet um, from the university. Uh, Chun makes a, an email to all the faculty saying, hey, I just read this tweet. That's, that's how I found out. And it's, anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, yeah, thanks for the link in chat if uh, anybody hasn't seen the link yet. Uh, I believe that link is to a news story of just some uh, someone who also read the tweet, if I'm not mistaken. Just says Cuomo confirmed, it doesn't say where the reporter got their information from. They probably, I don't know if there was an actual question. Anyway, uh, which was it somebody was looking for? What was it? Go to what? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, can we, can we put our hacking to good use? Uh, but, um, yeah, it could be semester long. I don't know. I, I think it, uh, for us, I don't think it's going to affect us too much. We'll figure out something with labs. And, uh, it's just uh, another reason to leverage some more technology. I leverage a lot of technology already for this course, so we're, we're set up for it. Uh, the labs, it'll be a little tricky. I'll figure something out and, and uh, we'll get through it. Uh, other courses, courses that depend on the physical labs, that's the bigger concern, like chemistry. How are you going to do chemistry online? You need to get in there with the lab. Any exams, I mean, I got rid of a lot of written exams for this course, but if you have written exams, how are you going to do that? I'm like, so a lot of courses have a lot to figure out, but not us so much. All right, so uh, immutability, let's talk about this. Any other questions before we dive into this? Immutability. So the lecture question today is all about constructing an immutable object. How are we going to... I gotta shift gears here. I've been, uh, I've been fired up about that tweet. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so we want to build these immutable objects. We want the advantages of immutability, which uh, the big advantage is that if you have the, a reference to an object in two different places in your code, what we saw with references earlier is that if the state of that object changes on the heap, that change is reflected everywhere in your program. Sometimes we want this feature, we want that state to be changing and be reflected everywhere. When we're thinking in an object-oriented programming mindset, we can leverage that to be able to get our effects reflected throughout the program. And we have methods, write methods that intentionally have those side effects, where we call a method that returns unit, but that method goes to the heap, makes a change in the state of an object on the heap, 
and we can see that change reflected. So one, one example would be like uh, list, not in Scala, but like list.add or list.append in, in, uh, in other languages. We call that method specifically for its side effect of modifying that list, adding that new element to the list. In Scala, we're really strong on immutability. We're using immutable lists where the object on the heap cannot change. We don't want that to change anywhere, so anybody with a reference to that object can know that that object is not going to change and can take that into consideration when they're computing. Knowing that it's not going to change can really help them, uh, can really benefit our code, writing our code, knowing that it's not going to change. Uh, specifically, when we talk about concurrency, you have two pieces of code running at the same time, and maybe two pieces of code running on different machines even, accessing the same, uh, the same data. We don't want that data to change out from underneath one of those pieces of code. If this code over here is appending to a list, and this code uh, it, during that operation is iterating through that list, we can get some really messed up results. We don't want that. We don't want references changing if we have concurrent code. It's a big concern. If all our objects are immutable, they can't change once they're created, no issues. So to that end, we, our lecture question today is to do this with a point. Create a point class that has x, x and y as doubles. These are values, so they cannot change, but use the keyword val so we can have access to them outside of the class. These are named variables. We're going to use val so we can access them from outside. Therefore, in your testing, you can say uh, p1.x, p1.y, or whatever you name your variable. So you can access these, you can test them, you can make sure they are the values that you want in your test. We want these two methods that are seemingly going to modify this point. Add, which is going to take another point, and I'm thinking of vector addition here. I probably could have called this vector. Would have been more accurate. Um, I'm thinking vector addition, where we're going to do component-wise addition. If I have the point 1, 2, and I want to add the point 4, 1 to it, I'm going to have the point 5, 3. So we want to make a change, a change to the point, but we can't change it because it's immutable. We can't change x and y because we use val, those are values, we're not having any mutable state. So what we're going to do is return a brand new point with that change reflected in it. So we're going to create a new point with the x's summed together and the y's summed together. Return a reference to that new point, and then that's how we're going to get this, this kind of illusion of changing state but without actually modifying that object on the heap. So multiply by scalar, same idea. We're going to multiply both x and y by some double. Return a brand new point with that new x and y. So we want to have these methods return new points with that change applied. Then do our testing, be able to make sure that that state is not changing in the underlying, in the original point. Uh, one thing to be careful about with this is the fact that I use the name point for this, uh, this is something I don't do earlier in the semester. If you're ever wondering in what physics engine, why I named that class physics vector and not just vector, it's because vector already exists in the standard library. Uh, there's at least one other class named vector. So and you have to be careful with your imports. If I name that vector, you have to make sure you're importing physics.vector and not uh, java.whatever2dgraphics.vector. Uh, and that's a very, it's a common mistake if I have a name that matches the name in the standard library. Like I do here, there are a lot of classes named point in the standard library between Scala and Java. Uh, you'll have a whole list if you go to the auto import. You'll get a whole list of different points you can import. Make sure you're importing functions. Functions, right? Yeah, functions.point to make sure that you're importing the point that you're writing for this lecture question. So it's something to be careful about. Earlier in the semester, I avoid these by, by naming things physics vector, which nobody's going to name something physics vector. I don't have to worry about name conflicts because it's a silly name. But if I just named it vector, then I have name conflicts. And then office hours are, are a lot of why is everything broken? And then it's the important thing. At this point in the course, we're about at the halfway point. I want to start, um, start reinforcing this idea that we have to watch the packages. We have to import the proper classes and that there can be classes with different names. So at this point I have a more intentional naming conflict so we can import the proper thing. But weeks one through three, those weeks are already stressful enough. I'm not gonna add anything more to those, those weeks. Those weeks are quite chaotic as everybody's going, what's Scala, what's IntelliJ, getting everything set up. I don't wanna add something extra to that by naming that vector in physics engine. So if you're wondering, if you're ever wondering about my, my naming uh, 
my naming is sometimes silly. Sometimes I'm just wrong, like a flashlight. But, uh, uh, but if you're ever wondering about like physics vector, that there was a reason for that. All right, any questions on this question before we dive into some content? I read the mid-semester reviews and somebody ranted about flashlight for a while. I, I, I mean, I have no excuse for that one. It's one word, it's not two words. Uh, so it's on my mind again. All right, anyway, mutable objects. Uh, not, not to go too far on this tangent, but I mean, I could have an entire course where I'm just absolutely perfect, and then one capital L. No one will ever let me let that live that down. I could be 99.999%. That's an F for me. That's how I'm judged. It's uh, it's crazy, but uh, there's a lot of pressure. But most things, I like to think I live up to it. But uh, you know, mistakes are made sometimes. Um, so mutable objects. Let's talk about these things. So I, I talked about a decent amount of this in uh, when I was talking about the lecture question, but these are objects that go on the heap and the state cannot change. We have these state variables and those values cannot change in those variables. Uh, I should actually call them values to be more specific, but the state cannot change in those objects. Once an object, an immutable object is created on the heap, it is what it is and it's like that forever. Uh, and, um, its state is that initial state forever. They are still stored on the heap, and they're still passed by reference, but we don't get that behavior that we expect from references, where you give a reference to a method and you might see side effects. We don't get that with immutable objects because they cannot change. So when we don't want those side effects to be possible, we don't want somebody to be able to mess up our objects, but we still want to give them references to it, that's when we're going to use those, these immutable objects. Uh, so the big question is, what if we do want the state to change? I have an object, maybe, it's, uh, uh, maybe it is a point representing the location of something in, uh, in some simulated world, and we want that location to move around. What, how do we do that if we can't change the state? And for that, we're going to simulate those changes by creating new objects of the same type that's a complete copy of the object that we want to simulate the change for. It's a complete copy of that but with the change applied. That, and that's going to be the theme throughout today's lecture, throughout these immutability talks. Create a new object with the change applied and return a reference to that brand new object. So we're creating a complete copy of the object that, um, that we already have, but with the change. So let's take a look at an, an example of this. I'm going to create a very simple uh, kind of academic feeling class. Immutable counter, it's going to initialize some counter through its constructor. And this counter, I'm not using val or var, so this counter is not accessible from outside of the class, and it's a value. It de uh, without using val or var, it defaults to val, and it can't be accessed from outside the class. It's like a private value, uh, if you will. So counter, uh, we're going to initialize to some value, can't change, but we want to simulate counting up and counting down. Uh, Making this not accessible at all, this is a little artificial in that I want to be able to see what the value of counter is, so I have this method to print out the value of it, but I'm not making it accessible. Um, I'm only doing that just to force recursion because I want to show, I want to take advantage of every opportunity I see, even if it's just a glimpse of an opportunity like I saw here. I just want more and more examples of recursion. I think recursion is one of those things that you just need example after example after example. So even though I'm not specifically talking about recursion in this lecture, I'm going to sneak in some recursion examples just to reinforce that more and more and more. I want to get those recursion examples in there. So I'm going to force a little recursion by hiding counter, or else uh, what we want to do here is increase the counter by 10. Uh, if you wanted to do something like that, you would just say, uh, you would just say counter dot, uh, new counter of counter dot counter plus 10, and you'd be done. You wouldn't have to use any recursion. But I have this this setup so we can only increase and decrease the counter by one, so we can increment and decrement. And those are our only operations that we have access to, and then we can just peek at what the value of the counter is by printing that to the screen, which does mutate the you know, standard out. Technically, we have some mutability in here. Uh, the, the state of the console is changing. Um, but we get the spirit of what we want to do here. So whenever we increment or decrement, we can't change counter, 
but we're going to return a brand new immutable counter with that change of five, either that counter plus one or that counter minus one, to be able to simulate a counter that's either counting up or counting down. So what if we want to increment this 10 times? We only have a method that can increment once. So this is where we would normally use a loop and a bar. We would say bar, counter, uh, immutable counter equals new immutable counter of 10. And then we would iterate through. And at each iteration, we would, uh, we would say 4 i in 0 until 10 to make sure we get 10 increments. And then the body of the loop, we would say counter equals counter dot increase. And then we'd be able to count up 10 with that. So what we would normally do is call increase, get that in reference to the brand new immutable counter, and reassign it to the variable that stores our counter. So we're updating the reference that's stored in that variable every time we call that, uh, call that increase method in that loop. So we keep reassigning the variable, and that's how we get the total changes, all 10 calls to increase, reflected in that variable that we had. But of course, we don't want to use var for these two weeks, which is just, uh, again, an artificial way of forcing recursion here. So I want to force recursion to see how we would do this in a recursive way. So when you do have situations where it's not artificial, you actually do have to, uh, or I'm hesitant to say that, where you have to use recursion, but where it's more convenient to use recursion than iteration, uh, which we'll see in full force when we get to trees. Then, uh, then we want to be able to be prepared for that so we know how to set up recursion to be able to solve something like that. So here's my recursion. I have my base case of n equals zero. Trivial input output behavior. If you give me an immutable counter and you say I want to increase this counter by n, and n is zero, well, you gave me no work to do, I'm just gonna return that counter back to you. So my base case, n is zero, just return that counter. There's no incrementing, no decrementing to be done uh, if, if you're not asking for any change. So base case, trivial input output behavior, got it. My two recursive cases here are if n is less than zero or n is greater than zero. So do you want, uh, do you want this to be decremented or do you want this to be incremented? In either way, either case, I'm either going to increase or decrease that counter by one. So this gets a brand new counter that I'm going to use in the recursive call. Then in the recursive call, I'm going to push n one closer to zero. So if I was negative, I'm going to add one to n. So for example, if this was called with negative three, I'm going to call decrease once, and then call make the recursive call on negative two, then the recursive call on negative one, and then the recursive call on zero, base case is going to return and give me those values back. If I'm increasing, if n is positive, I'm going to decrement n by one, and then call increase once. Use up, um, uh, reflect one of those calls to increase, one of those increments. So I have my base case, trivial input output behavior, my recursive calls, which are always getting closer to my base case, and I have all my logic working under the assumption that the recursive calls are going to be correct. If I give this recursive call of n minus one, if n is positive and I say, give me this new counter after being incremented once, incremented n minus one times, then I'm going to get the, uh, then I'm going to get that one extra increase after the recursive return and get the full n increase from that recursive call, from the, uh, from this call of the recursion. Any questions on this example before we get into some stacking heap? Stacking heap about to make a big return. And, I, and if you, uh, depending on what happens with the lab, but whatever happens with the functional programming uh, verification lab, you can count on stacking heap diagrams being on there. Uh, that's one of the ways you can make up that learning objective one, the stacking heap ones. We're going to see a lot of stacking heaps in whatever shape or form that lab ends up taking. Question? Do you have a question? Update counter of, like, what is this supposed to do? Yeah, 
So, so I'm saying I want to, uh, like this call update counter 20 of counter says, I want to increase this counter's variable by 20. So I have some counter, it happens to be initialized to 10. I want to increase it by 20, so when I print this counter, uh, counter two, print counter, I should get 30 printed to the screen. Uh, and then since it's immutable, counter.printCounter, that's always going to print 10 no matter what else we do. And then update counter is going to return a new counter with this plus 20 applied to this counter. And we'll get that 30 printed here. Not necessarily right there, but yes, it will get rid of those. So, and that's something I won't talk about in detail. I have a bullet point on one slide where I'll talk about this, but they will get garbage collected. So when we, so when we make this recursive call, uh, each time we're, each time we're going down this uh, recursion, we're creating a new counter on every single recursive call. So if n is 1,000 here, we're going to end up putting 1,000 new immutable counters on the heap, which is going to take up a good amount of space, it, it, you know, a decent amount of space, not too much, it's just one int. Uh, so not too much space, but you know, if we call this with a million, it's starting to get up there. But each time we go down the recursion, we actually, this is a little more complex answer than, than, than you might have wanted, but, uh, but each time we go down the recursion, that stack, that reference to this counter gets lost because we don't store that reference anywhere. So we don't have a reference to this object that's on the heap anymore. So since we don't have any objects to that, uh, references to that object, we have no way of ever accessing that object again. And when that's the case, we have what's called garbage collection. The JVM is gonna come through, look at everything on the heap, and anything where we don't have a reference uh, to that object anymore within our control, it's going to free up that space, delete that object, and get rid of it. Since we have no access to it anymore, we won't even notice that it's gone. There's no change in our program whether it's there or not. Uh, so those, those objects are just gonna get cleaned up. So we'll, we will end up creating a lot of objects and putting them all on the heap, but the garbage collection is gonna come through and, and clean all that up. It might not happen instantly. We have no control of when the garbage collection happens. That's, uh, that's more JVM details of however it's optimizing all of its garbage collection. Uh, but it will be cleaned up. It can be cleaned up at some point. And if, we're, if we call update counter with a million, uh, it's gonna have to get in there a few times. Do you think it's possible that it's able to do it while it's going? Oh yeah, okay. yeah, certainly. It'll certainly do it mid-recursion, it can. Uh, if we have enough calls, uh, I mean, we can call this with a billion in the, or let's say a trillion, uh, just to make sure that it's larger than random. We can call this with a trillion. It's going to have to get in there and collect some garbage, or else we can't. Uh, we can't do that. I have uh, it commented out, but if you download the, the code, if you pull the repo, uh, get this example. I have a commented out line that calls this with a million with the comment, the question that I'll, I'll let you ponder, should that work? Can we call update counter one million counter? Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll let everyone think about it a bit, but, um, but I can talk about that if, if we have some time. But you can run it and see. I mean, do you think it'll work? Will it not work? Intuitively, it seems like it shouldn't, but I don't know. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Any other questions about this example, actually? Okay. Strings are immutable. I, I say this a lot. Strings and lists, those, these are the two examples we're going to see today. These are the two objects we use most often that are immutable. And I say that they're immutable, and I've said this, let's pretend, strings are objects, but let's pretend they're on the stack. I've said this kind of stuff earlier in the semester. 
Let's demystify that stuff and talk about what all of this actually means. What does it mean for strings to be immutable? What does it mean that strings are actually on the heap, but they behave like they're on the stack? Let's, uh, let's pull all that apart and see. So strings are working just like, strings in list are working just like your lecture question. You can't change them, they are immutable. None of the state of the string, the characters that, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that comprise that string, that character array in the string, cannot change, you can't change a single character of a string once it's created. So every time you uh, seemingly make a change to a string, when, when you pretend that you're changing a string, what you're actually doing, that method is creating a brand new string with the change reflected and returning that. Again, that's going to be the theme today. That's how these immutable objects work. That's how we kind of simulate change from immutable objects. So let's take a look at this. And you know, now that I think about this more, I'm missing a lot, of, a lot in this example. I'll talk about it as I go through, but I, I missed a, a lot of small details in this. I'll talk about them. They're not too important for the topic that we're talking about, but uh, just subtle differences that, uh, to be honest, even if I did notice, I wouldn't have put it on the slide because uh, it wouldn't all fit. But let's talk about this example. Let's just talk quickly about what we're doing. We're creating some strings. We're calling some methods that are going to pass those strings by reference. So we're getting a reference to the strings on the heap. Uh, and then just doing some printing out. You could uh, certainly should be able to follow this code and see what it's going to print out at the end. But let's take a look at what's going on on the heap with these immutable strings, see what's going on. So I jumped into somewhat the middle of this execution so we don't have to step through the first few steps. But let me talk about what those steps did that we missed. We started with main. We uh, created a string object with the characters CC116. We, this looks like a string literal, uh, and that's what we call them in the code. But this is the same as saying new string in creating a brand new object. We are creating a new string object. We just have different syntax when we're talking about strings. So this creates a new string object, puts it on the heap, gives it that value from the constructor, and returns a reference to that. And for these examples, I'm just going to simplify my references a little. Instead of having random numbers, uh, I used random numbers before to drive the point home that these things are anywhere in RAM. We don't know where they are. They jump around all over the place. I'm going to simplify my references and just start sequentially at one, uh, just to make the, uh, the numbers a little cleaner. Uh, so it's going to return this reference wherever we ended up getting space for the heap. That reference is going, this expression is going to resolve to that reference to the string on the heap. Then we're going to store that reference in this value named course of type string. So we're going to store this on the stack in the main frame. We're going to call nerf. That's going to get, uh, get the value of course. This variable resolves to the value that is the reference to this, to this string. That's going to go into the parameter. That's going to get that argument. And we're going to have this line of code running with input storing the reference at one is a reference to that string on the heap. And this is where we get to start seeing our immutability. So this string, now that it's on the heap and it's created, it's immutable, cannot change ever. That string is what it's going to be forever. Cannot change. So once we get this method call, what this method is going to do is take this string, replace all the sixes with fives, but it doesn't change this string. It's going to have to create a brand new string to be able to make that simulated change. So we get a brand new string created on the heap. We get memory allocated for it on the heap. And this memory reference and takes two string references. So those references have to be created on the stack. There's no magic here. We can't shortcut that. Uh, the string six has to be an object created on the heap. Give the reference to the replace method. Um, so those would be more, more things on the stack, or on the heap. So this change that we see with the replace method, is that going to be re reflected by creating a brand new string object and returning a reference to it? And this is where we would get jammed up in 115. I think every student, everybody makes, uh, makes this mistake at first, um, is you would just evaluate replace, 
and then expect input to have that change reflected. Input's a reference here, so you would expect to see that change in course. You would expect course to have the, this, the value 115 at this point. It does not. In fact, uh, we, we evaluate this new string, create a new string, and we don't even do anything with that reference. The return type here is unit, so we don't even return that reference. Nothing happens with it. We evaluate it, we put it on the heap, and then we just walk away from it and don't do anything with it. So this method call does absolutely nothing that we can change that we can see. So after this method call, the state of the stack is actually exactly the same as it was before that method call. The method call did absolutely nothing. Uh, it had no change, no effect on our program that we can see. All it did was change some heap space, but we have no reference to this string. So we have no way of knowing that that even exists. There's no access to it. No change was made to our program because we didn't do anything with that reference. And we, we just called a method on an immutable data type, created a new one, didn't do anything with it, didn't do anything with that reference. So we actually didn't get anywhere with that. Since we have no references to two, I mentioned this earlier, so I won't talk about it too much here. Uh, since we have no references to two, that can be garbage collected. That might disappear, it might not disappear, depending on how the JVM is optimizing that day and how everything is uh, working behind the scenes. Uh, but we don't have a reference to it, so whether it's garbage collected or not, we, one, don't care because we don't have a reference to it, and two, can't ever tell. We don't know if that's going to be, when that's going to be garbage collected. Next, we make a call to amplify. We give it course again. Course is still pointing to this first string, so we're going to get at one. We're going to call at one dot replace 116 with 250. Replace is going to create a brand new string with that change reflected in it, and then return a reference to that new string. So this input dot replace this call in this instance is going to resolve to at three that reference to that string. And then we are actually going to return it. We have our return type of string. We're going to return that and actually store it in a variable. So since we're passing that reference back out of the method call, we actually do get to see this change reflected. It's not going to be reflected in at one that we gave it, but we are going to get a brand new reference at three, and that's what's going to be stored in data structures in this variable. So we have this variable, which is going to store at three, which is this brand new string that was created inside this method call. And now we do have a reference to three, we actually can work with that and see that change we didn't lose that value on the stack, and it's not going to be garbage collected because we have a reference to it on the stack, or access to a reference. The, the references and, um, can, get, can be complex, but the garbage collector is going to know if we have access to something. For example, if we had a reference to an object that had a string as a state variable, and that variable had a reference to another string, yeah, even if it's not, that's not on the stack that references the string, but we do have some way of following references to be able to find it, it's not going to get garbage collected. Uh, this one happens to be directly on the stack, so we of course have access to this one. Uh, it's not going to be garbage collected. All right, we move on to the next line. We're up, we're not in a method call, we're writing the main method, but we are calling the concatenation method. We're going to append is great, to this course. This concatenation, just like the replace method, this is going to be a method call on the course object. We're going to go to this object. We're going to add. We're actually going to create a brand new string on the stack that's not shown. We're going to concatenate with that new string reference and create a brand new string at this memory address 4. We're going to create this brand new string, and that reference to that new string is going to be returned from the concatenation operator. So I'm taking course, concatenating it with is great. This expression, which is the concatenation method call, resolves to this reference. It resolves to at four in this case. But we don't do anything with it. Again, just like that first method call, we're not assigning it to a value, we're not assigning it to a variable, we're not using it as an, uh, an argument in a method call. We're not doing anything with that reference. We just leave it on the ground and walk away from it. So after this line executes, we have no access to this string that was created. So we created a string, but we did absolutely nothing with it. 
just left the reference lying on the ground and walked away. So that string that was created has no effect on our program at all, and it's a candidate to be garbage collected that can be destroyed any time now. We wouldn't know, it would have no effect on us if that was completely gone, removed from the heap. This is a common thing. I'd say the replace is more common uh, as that beginner mistake, where you call replace and you just expect your string to be different after that call. And then uh, you come to office hours, tearing your hair out in, in 115. I don't see this much in 116 anymore. Uh, and you go to office hours and you, um, and you're just told you have to reassign that to the variable. And we don't really explain why. I mean, we can explain all this, but your eyes will glaze over in 115. Uh, we just say you have to assign that back to the variable that doesn't actually modify the string. You have to reassign it. And you might have been wondering, well, why do I have to do that? It's ridiculous. This is why we have immutable strings, uh, definitely in Scala and in Java, but most languages have immutable strings. You can't change a, a string in most languages. You have to reassign those things back to the variable where it came from. You'd have to do, if you wanted this change to be reflected, you would do course equals course plus is great. Then you actually get to see that change. Of course, you would need a variable for that example. All right, and next, we have doing the similar thing, course plus is fun. Again, is fun and is great, those would be separate strings on the heap. Uh, but course is fun, we're going to create another new string object with that concatenation reflected. Get a new reference, this resolves to that reference at five. We're going to store that in course string. Now since we're storing that returned reference, we actually do have access to that string after that, uh, that concatenation method call. Then when we print these out, we're going to get course, course at 1, 116, data structures at 3, 250, course string at 5, CC 116 is fun. That's what we're going to get printed to the screen. And this at 2, at 4, we don't have access to those strings. They might have been garbage collected by now by the time we get to the print statements. We don't know, we don't care, they have no effect on our program. Questions on this example? All right. Lists are immutable. I didn't realize how close we were to the end. Let me try to get through this list example. Lists are immutable. We've talked about this throughout the, the whole semester, so let's crack this one open and, and see the same thing. It's going to follow the same idea as the string example, where these lists, when they're on the heap, once we give a list, create a list and give it some values, list cannot change ever. It's never going to change. We create this list on the stack. This list at this reference will always only contain the value 2. It cannot ever, can never, ever, ever change. The only thing it can do is we can uh, lose all references to it and it can get garbage collected, but it cannot change. So let's take a look at this example. I want to find the first n primes. I want to find the first three primes in this case. I'll quickly walk through this code. I have two examples of recursion. I told you I'm going to try to get them in whenever I can. Uh, so we have two recursive methods in this example. We're going to call find first n primes of three. I would expect this to print uh, five, five, three, and two. Uh, it will end up printing them in that order. But two, three, and five in some order. The order is not defined. So I have this recursive method that says, as a base case, if n is less than 1, return empty list. This is kind of my error, uh, error handling. If somebody gives me a negative number, give me the first negative 5 primes. I'm just going to be like, what are you doing? I'm going to give you the empty list. Uh, n equals 0 makes more sense. Give me the first 0 primes. Here's an empty list. Um, if n equals 1, this is kind of my true base case. This is the one I, I'm going to leverage quite a bit. Give me the first 1 prime, trivial input output behavior. The first prime is 2. Return a list with just 2 in it. And that's, uh, that's the current spot where we're at right now. We have three recursive calls on the stack, and we're creating that base case list that we're going to start appending to, uh, prepending to, to be able to get all the primes and collect all those primes as we go up the recursion. So we're at the bottom of the recursion right now. Those recursive steps, like our first call of 3, hit the recursive step. That's going to find the first n minus 1 prime, so the first 2 primes, and that's going to make the recursive call of the first 1 prime, which hits our base case. Our recursive step, we're going to code 
under the assumption that this was correct. If I have the first n minus 1 primes, how do I compute the nth prime? That's the challenge that we have. We're going to assume that this is correct. Our recursive call is getting closer to our base case, so we're good with that. So if we write this logic under the assumption that this is correct, then it will, through the power of recursion, be correct. Our assumption can validate itself. So if I have the first n primes, what I'm doing is finding the maximum prime. The order is, um, the order is not defined, so I'm going to call dot max. This is going to reduce the list based on the max method. So I'm going to get the maximum value in this list. It's uh, just a shorthand method uh, that Scala has built in for us. I'm going to get the maximum value, the maximum prime, and I'm going to call this find prime, which is going to test primes starting at max prime plus one, and then keep incrementing and checking the next, next prime and the next prime, given a list of known primes. When this returns, I'm going to append that to the primes that I have. This should be the nth prime, and these are the n minus one, first n minus one primes. We're going to return that list with those appended to them. Find prime is another recursive method. I'm going to test, is i prime with these known primes? So if i is prime, I'm going to use fold left, initialize it with false, and say if, and this line's pretty dense, I know, uh, but if i is not divisible by any of the known primes, then it itself must be prime, return it, it's prime. If i is not prime, check i plus one. So it's gonna keep incrementing and checking until it finds a prime, something that's not divisible by any of the known primes, that must be the next prime. All right, so we're at this step of the recursion where we hit the base case, create a brand new list, put it on the heap, and then we're going to start passing this list around by reference. So the return call of this base case recursion is going to be a reference to that list that was created for the base case. I'm going to return that to this recursive call with n equals two. So the n minus one primes is going to be this reference at one. Those, that's a reference to the first n minus one prime, so the first one prime, n being two. Max prime, two. I'm going to call max prime on that at one. And now I'm at my next recursive call for my second recursive method. I'm going to call find prime of, oh, I missed a colon there, of two plus one, so three, and this list at one. I'm going to get here, I'm going to check is three, I'm going to pass that list by reference, that at one. I'm going to get check, is three divisible by two? Nope. Three must be prime, that's my next prime. So I'm going to return the base case, return three, and here's where we get to see some immutable list action. Find prime resolved to three, and we're prepending that to our list of known primes, our n minus one primes, which is this list at one, containing just the value two. This list cannot change. So when I'm prepending a value to this list, prepend is going to return a brand new list which is a copy of the original list with that one value prepended to it. So we're going to have that value prepended to it, return a reference to that brand new list. This, we're at the last line, so this is going to be the return value of this recursive call. All this stuff, all this frame gets blown up off the heap, and it's going to return at two, this new list containing three and two. Now my top level recursive call is going to get that reference at two, it's going to keep, uh, continue its computation based on that return value. And as all this is happening, I guess since I said important, I better read it at this time. I was going to read it a little later. But uh, uh, as we're going through this, any list that's on the heap cannot change. They're not changing. This is the whole idea. I know I'm repeating this a lot today, but this is the, the important point. These lists are not changing on the heap. If some other part of my program has a reference to at one, to that list, no matter what we do, we cannot interfere with the computation of that other code. No matter what, that list cannot change. If I want to simulate changes to this list, I have to create new lists, and then I can work with that too. That other code can still work with that one, and we're not interfering with each other at all 
because of immutability. That's what immutability is really gaining for us, is we can't mess up somebody else's computation. So we return, so we return at two. This top level recursive call gets at two. It's going to continue its logic based on that. It's gonna find the max value, that's three. We're going to make this recursive call to find prime with three plus one, four. And our condition for our base case is false this time. We're going to check. Is 4 divisible by 3? No. Is 4 divisible by 2? Yes. Therefore, this is not prime. We just found a factor for it. It's not prime. So we're going to hit our recursive call, find prime of the next number. We're going to check 5 against these known primes, against 3 and 2. Is 5 the next prime given these known primes? Of course it is. 5. Uh, not divisible by 3 or 2, of course. We're going to return 5. That's going to be the return value of this call. We're going to return 5 to the other level of the recursion. This is at its last line. So that's just going to return 5, uh, which is tail recursion, but we don't have time for that, uh, that sidetrack. Uh, we're going to return 5 back up the recursion. This is going to get that return value of five. This resolves to five for this frame. And we're going to prepend that to the list at two. That's going to return a brand new list that's created with a copy of all the elements of two and five prepended to that. So we get a brand new copy. Those two lists that we already created are unaffected. Anybody with references to those lists are, are unaffected by this change. And we get this third list, which is our final return value. And then the main method is happy because it gets this reference at three, which is a list containing those first three primes that it asked for. So it's happy. It can print five, three, and two to the, to the screen. And all the functionality is, is there. We have what we need. Uh, but we, we did end up creating three lists on the heap, which we'll see is not actually that big of a deal when we talk about linked lists. We actually didn't copy those elements, but that's topic for another day when we come back from spring break. Uh, but we did get those primes that we were asked to compute. All right, any questions? Any quick questions? We're out of time. All right, let's see everyone Friday. Yeah, we can, we can.